Well, good morning and welcome to our Easter gathering here at Story Church. We're so thankful that you'd give us some time this morning to gather and worship our King Jesus. Let me introduce myself a little bit. My name's Travis Cunningham, and I get to serve as one of the pastors here at Story Church. And, and let me orient you a little bit to who we are at Story Church. Here at the church, we exist to know, live, and share the one true story. Now, when we're saying that, we're talking about the true story of the gospel, and I really want to key in on that word true there, because oftentimes we can kind of think that the story of Jesus is mythical, or, or it's not quite true, or it's a little bit made up, but what we're celebrating today on this Easter Sunday is that the gospel is true, that the resurrection happened, and we can be secure in our risen King Jesus. So we pray that today you would hear that message, the story of Jesus, on repeat through our singing, through the word of God and through our preaching. Now, if this is your first or second time with us at Story Church, I want you to go visit our website and fill out our Connect card there, or you can download our app and do it straight from the app. We'd love to get to know you a little bit, uh, your name, where you're coming from, any questions you might have, or ways in which we can serve you. In addition, we've got a prayer card on there, or you can text to pray us at that number on your screen. Right now, as we find ourselves in shelter in place, one of the only things we have right now is prayer, and that's not bad. It's good because our God hears us and he responds to our prayers, so we would love to pray alongside you with any needs you might have. Now, I've just got one quick announcement for us this morning. If you've been watching Story Church in our digital gatherings over the past few weeks, or you just kind of stumbled across this link today and this morning and you're worshiping with us, I want to invite you next Sunday, April 19th at 11 a.m., right after after our gathering, we're going to have what we call starting point. Now, starting point is your opportunity to get to know more about Jesus and more about this church. We'd love to walk with you along, alongside you on, on what it means to follow Jesus, how to follow Jesus, what is Story Church all about, and how can you get connected to the life of the church here. I love starting point. It's one of the, my favorite things we do here at this church, and so I would love to meet you, albeit across Zoom across a digital gathering, but I'd love to see your face there and get to know your story a little bit and share a little bit of our story. Now, in just a second, we're going to sing, but before we do that, I want to call us to worship, and I, I want to I just orient a little bit of what's going on here. Uh, right now, if we can think a little bit about what we're doing, we're worshiping in living rooms all across the Inland Empire and all across Southern California, and this is not that different from what the original disciples experienced. I mean, think about this. Their, their Savior that they walked with for three years on Friday dies on a cross for their sins. On Saturday, he was in the grave. And on Sunday, they were in their homes around a table with their loved ones awaiting their Messiah. And Jesus came and he delivered and he appeared to them. And right now we find ourselves in our homes, in our living rooms, eating meals, drinking a hot cup of coffee. Uh, we are with those closest to us. And the really good news is that Jesus is still active. He is still mighty. He is still working. And we pray that you would get to know him more this morning. Now, we're going to transition. I'm going to read Psalm 118, a portion of it over us. And I want you to hear about this Savior and what he's done in our place. As we transition to worship, just bow your heads and, and quiet your hearts as I read God's word over us. Psalm 118, I'm going to read verses 19 through 29, says, Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and you have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We 
bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has made his light to shine upon us. Bind the festal sacrifice with cords up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Join me now in a word of prayer. God, we love you. And we thank you that the stone that the builders rejected is now the cornerstone. He is our savior. He is the gates of righteousness and the gates of salvation. And through him, we can be saved and our lives can be built upon this cornerstone. And so we give thanks this morning to you. We extol you. We praise your name. We do it through song and we do it through responding to you in prayer. So we ask God that you would minister to us today, wherever we find ourselves, whatever emotions we are feeling, Healing, whatever chaos is going on around us, God, we ask that you would still us, you would appear to us, and you would minister to us. In Christ's name, amen.
that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure how great the pain of searing loss the father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory behold the man upon the cross my sin upon his shoulders ashamed i hear my mocking voice call among the scoffers it was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished his dying breath has brought me life i know that it is finished i will not boast in Father, we have nothing that we can boast in. You have saved us from our sins. You have saved us from ourselves. Nothing we could offer, no gifts, no power, no wisdom, no effort that we could put through. God, you did it for us. You saved us. You loved us first when we were unlovable. When we didn't even want you, you wanted us. So Father, we just thank you this morning as we celebrate Easter, we celebrate death and resurrection that there is resurrection power in our lives today. So Father, we thank you. How deep truly is your love for us, Lord. It's hard for us to fathom, hard for us to believe, but we thank you this morning. We ask these things in your name, amen. Well, now we're going to transition to a time of looking at God's word together. So if you have a Bible, go ahead and grab that and flip with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're in our Gospel and Weird Times series, and we're going to continue to celebrate that in these weird times we find ourselves in, but with a particular look at the resurrection of Jesus Christ and how that changes our lives and how we interact with this world. So go ahead and grab your Bibles, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And before we jump into the text, what, what I want to do is you, you may have seen on Instagram or Twitter or Facebook or somewhere this past week a hashtag that said, Jesus changed my life. I shared my story and, and a bunch of people at Story Church shared their story and really it went viral across the globe. And, and so let me just kind of reshare my story a little bit that I shared on Instagram. And, and then I want to draw out some ingredients that we see in there. So I was born and raised in a Christian home. Uh, we were churchgoers. 
followers. Uh, my parents uh, did the best they could. They prayed for us. They exposed us to Jesus. And yet, I don't remember ever hearing the gospel. I'm sure it was spoken, but my ears were closed to it. And I made some really clear decisions early in my life that I was going to live for myself. I was going to live for my own agenda. I was going to live for my own glory. And so I threw myself into everything I could to try and advance the name of Travis Cunningham. And so I tried really hard in school. I tried to show off whatever intellect I have. I, I threw myself into sports and, and I wanted to be the best at all sports, uber competitive, uber ambitious. I wanted to win and make others look bad in the process. I, I tried to make friends with the cool people to be a part of whatever the in crowd was. And, and all the, the whole time, what was going on internally and underneath all of that effort and all of that trying was a deep-seated insecurity that I really wanted to be accepted. I really wanted a place to belong. I really wanted someone to say, hey, I love you and I'm with you. And, and I went to all the wrong wells to find those things. And, and at the end of the day, I don't need to recount what all those things were, but what those things were, were sin. I rebelled against God. I turned from him. I trusted in myself and I trusted in the things that this world has to offer. And then the summer before my senior year of high school, Jesus came stomping onto the scene and his grace and his mercy and his kindness came with him. I, for the first time, was able to hear the good news of the grace of Jesus Christ, that despite whatever sin I had committed, despite how far I had run from him, despite the vulgarity of the life that I was living, he still loved me and wanted me to or wanted to call me his own. And I turned from that sin in that moment and I trusted in Jesus and everything I was looking for with my insecurities, I found in right relationship with God. I found acceptance in Christ Jesus. I found a place to belong. I found a father and a family that loved me, not for what I had to offer because I didn't have much to offer, but they loved me simply because they loved me. And Jesus, Jesus changed everything in my life that summer, and I have not been the same since. My life since that moment has really just kind of been infected by his grace. It, it's been a lot of stumbling and, and, you know, two steps forward, one step back, and at times just trying to crawl towards Jesus, and it's been hard, and yet it's always been worth it because the world could never offer things to me that were truly joyful, truly satisfying, truly hopeful. And ever since I've followed Jesus, ever since I received his forgiveness, I've had an enduring joy, hope, and satisfaction in him. And so what I want you to know this morning is Jesus changed everything in my life, but he's still actively in the business of changing lives everywhere, including yours, potentially this morning. Now, you heard some things there in my story. You heard at the beginning some of the sin I was walking in, some of the rebellion against God. You, you heard this moment where God entered the picture with his grace and with his gospel. You heard the good news of Jesus, and then you heard him changing everything. And that's just simply the gospel story. Though all of our stories might be unique, we all share the same framework that we walk away from God. He chases us down and his grace redeems even the worst among us. The guy who wrote this text we're going to look at right now, the apostle Paul calls himself the chief of sinners and yet Jesus saw fit to save him. And so in just a moment, I'm going to read that text, 1 Corinthians 15, and I want you to draw out these pieces, the bad news, the good news, and what life looks like now. So join me in reading God's word here. 1 Corinthians 15. I'm going to read verses 54 through 57. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So we're gonna dissect that text here this morning, and we're gonna do it through the lens of the bad news, the good news, and the bridge. 
image being Jesus Christ. So first, let's look at the bad news together. And I just really feel compelled this morning to spell out the bad news in great detail for us. And and here's the reason why. You cannot get to the good news without traveling through the bad news first. And so I really want us to understand why the bad news is so devastating. You see, God is holy and perfect and blameless, and he is highly exalted, and he created us originally to live in his garden before him in perfect harmony, and and he was to be our God, and he was to dwell with us, and we were to be his people, dwelling with him forevermore, and then sin entered into the picture, and it fractured everything, and we became separated from, estranged from our creator God that we are created for. That's why this text will begin with perishable, when the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality. Paul is going to talk about here the difference between creator and creation. God is the perfect holy creator that is imperishable and immortal. We as fallen humans are mortal and perishable and we are separated from him. But the longings deep in each of our souls is to be with our God, to be in right relationship with him, to know him and love him, to be known and loved by him. That's why the fourth century theologian Augustine in his book Confessions says this, thou hast made us for thyself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it finds rest in thee. Translating that into modern English, we long for God and we are restless until we rest in him. This is the longing of all of our souls and yet sin creates further estrangement, further separation from God, further distance from being with our creator that we all want to be with. This is where we we start with the bad news. Now this text will spell out for us three specific enemies that are going to want to perpetuate the separation from God. They're going to want to further distance us from God. So look at verse 56 with me and, and look at this. Paul says, the sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. We see our three enemies here that want to separate us further from God. We see the law, we see sin, and we see death. We see the law of God, the, sin, the rebellion of sin, and the inevitability of death death. And so what I want to do is walk through all three of those and and show you why those things are our enemies and why they are bad news for us. So first, the bad news of the law. Let's look at the bad news of the law. The law is your first enemy. What does this mean? That, That the power of sin is the law. Well, first, let me start by saying this. The law is not evil. The law is God's idea and God is good and everything God does and all of his ideas are absolutely and perfectly good. So the law in of itself is not evil. It, the law is not in of itself the power of sin. It's what the law produces within us, what comes forth from our lives when we look closely at the law. Here's what I mean by that. The law of God is essentially the way that God has designed this world to operate. He has put boundaries in place for us to walk in obedience. He has commanded us how to live before him and with each other and when we perfectly obey God and when we perfectly follow his law, it results in our unending joy and satisfaction and flourishing. And yet the law will show us how we all fall short of that, how we all fall short of perfect obedience, how we do not always love and obey and follow God. Imagine for a second with me that the law of God is kind of this dartboard. You've probably played darts before. And and right in the middle of that dartboard, is the red bullseye. And the goal is to perfectly, with every thought, with every action, with every deed, with every word, to throw that dart right there in the center and hit the red bullseye every time. Now, we all fall short there. We don't hit the bullseye every time. Most times, we actually, with our thoughts and our deeds and our actions, we miss the dartboard altogether, kind of an errant throw. We fall short of the mark that God 
God has given us. This is why the law is the power of sin, because the law will reveal to us how utterly darkened and depraved we are, that we do not desire to obey obey God, and we never perfectly follow him. Elsewhere in the Bible, in Romans six, or Romans five, excuse me, Paul will say, "For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but catch this: sin is not counted where there is no law." In other words, how can we know there is sin if there is no law? How can we know that there is a mark to miss unless there is a mark at all? One commentator, when he's making note of this passage, will say this. The law, which is good, functions as the agent of sin because it either leads to the pride of achievement on the one hand or reveals the depth of one's depravity and rebellion against God on the other. In either case, it becomes death-dealing instead of life-giving. Now, walk with me through this. We try to obey the law. We we walk this tightrope, so to speak, but we always fall off the tightrope from one way or the other. We we might set up God's law as kind of this checklist, and we, we check the boxes for all the ones we obey, and then we pat ourselves on the back, And we say, look, through all my effort, how perfectly I obeyed God. And all we're doing there is falling off on the side of pride, which is sin, yet again. And and on the other hand, we might fall off towards the other end, where we'll say, look at how wrong I can be. Look at how rebellious I am. And we kind of revel in our own sin. We get joy out of how bad we can be. We rebel against God in that. But, But here's the key to that tightrope walk falling off on either side. All we're doing as humans is playing the comparison game. And there's a trap in the comparison game. Here's what goes on with this kind of law-abiding sinfulness. When we step into the pride of achievement and we say, look at how good I'm doing, all we are doing is being dishonest with ourselves because we don't perfectly obey God's law. And we also just compare ourselves against other humans who are doing a little less good than we are. Now, on the other end, we're going to compare ourselves with with others who are trying to do good and trying to do well. And we're going to say your effort is futile. But the key there is we are comparing ourselves against other fallen humans. That's not what the law is intended to do. The law is intended to lift our eyes off of other fallen humans and fix them squarely on the holy creator, spotless, blameless God of the universe, the one who is without sin. And when we look at God through the lens of the law, it's meant to make us all feel sinful and small. So this is why the law is our first enemy. It shows us how depraved we are and it further separates us from God. This is the bad news of the law. Next, let's look at the bad news of sin. The bad news of sin. Sin is our second enemy. So what is this missing the mark? What is this falling short? What is this inability to obey the law perfectly? This is the Bible's category called sin. This is simply what the Bible calls sin. And, 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 and sin is a refusal to love and to follow and to obey God and abide by his rule. It's to worship the created things rather than the creator, which is idolatry. It's to trust in ourselves rather than to trust in God. And deep down, each of us knows how guilty we are of this sin, And here's what happens with sin. It kind of entangles us in this nasty spider web with sin and with shame. Here's how it goes. We fail to follow God's law. We step into sin and then we begin to feel this thing called shame. And and we may not talk about shame externally, but internally each of us is kind of preaching to ourselves that, that I'm wrong, that I'm unworthy, that I'm unlovable, 
that I'm dirty, that no one could ever possibly love me. This is what shame is. And because we feel such deep shame in our bones, we look for an escape. We look for a moment of joy. We look for something to numb the pain that we are feeling. And instead of running to our good God who covers our shame and removes our shame, we run yet again to our sin. And for a fleeting moment, we find that escape. We find that joy. We find that numb feeling that we are so desperately searching for. But then, because it's fleeting, it wears off and we get ripped back down into this darkness and this brokenness even deeper than we were before. And we feel more shame. We feel more wrong. We feel more unlovable. And it creates a perpetual cycle. And the cycle is I sin because I feel shame and I feel shame because I sin. And it just keeps on going over and over again. And not a single one of us can escape from this reality. Romans 3.23 will say this, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Do you hear it there? All, that's all inclusive. Every single one of us has fallen short of God, fallen short of his requirements of us. Therefore, we are sinners and we walk in this cycle of estranging ourselves from God because of our sin. This is why sin is bad news and this is why it's your second enemy. Finally, let's look at the bad news of death. Your final and your ultimate enemy is death. Paul here in 1 Corinthians 15, he says the sting of death is sin. He's bringing about a word picture of kind of a, a deadly animal, like, like a scorpion or a snake or a spider of some sort that might sting you or it might bite you. And at that moment of being bit by that scorpion or stung by that scorpion, it, it injects a poison into your being that will ultimately kill you, whether it's slowly or it's quickly, either way, you cannot escape it and it will kill you. So uh, when I was in junior high, my, my dad was working up in the high desert area and he pulled off the freeway or the highway and he caught a wild tarantula. Okay, listen, I, I know tarantulas are, are fairly safe and, and mostly are non-venomous, but I don't like spiders. Those things are big and they're hairy and I was getting nowhere near that thing. And he, he brings that tarantula home and it finds kind of this all-inclusive resort at the Cunningham household down in our basement. It's got this terrarium. It's got, you know, a heat lamp. It's got foliage. We, we feed that thing or at least other people did. I wasn't going near that thing. And, and, and like d just the mere fact that my dad would pull off a freeway and catch a tarantula makes me wonder whether or not he's a psychopath and what else he's done in his life. I just, I'm just wondering. Um, I hope that's not offensive, Dad. Um, anyways, my dad's not a psychopath. Let me just say that. Uh, here's what Paul's doing in this word picture. He's saying, don't even mess with your sin. In the same way, I wasn't going to go to that tarantula. I wasn't going to try to play with it. I wasn't going to mess with it. I wasn't going to get near to it. Paul is going to say, when we play with sin, when we try to manage our own sin, when we tempt sin, ultimately we're going to get bit by this venomous animal and the sting of that animal is ultimately death. So, so Romans 6.23 will say it much more clearly. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. The payment for our collective sin is our death. Now, all of us are surrounded by a lot of death right now. This past week, I was on a phone call with a bunch of pastors from across the U.S., and, and one of my pastor friends up in the Brooklyn area was just kind of sharing what they're facing up there in the New York City area. And he was saying, in Brooklyn alone, there was 150,000 diagnoses of this virus in the last couple of weeks. The call was on Wednesday, and on Monday, there were 700 and something deaths. On Tuesday, there was more deaths. And on Wednesday, they were anticipating close to 800 deaths as a result of this virus. All of us are surrounded by death right now. 
And this isn't always a bad thing. We are becoming more acutely aware that despite advances in technology and science, we cannot escape the inevitability of death. We cannot escape the decaying of our bodies. We cannot escape what Paul will say is the fact that we are perishable beings that are full of sin. But but when Paul is saying the sting of sin is death, he's not just talking about physical death. He is certainly talking about that. Ultimately, he's rolling that past physical death and saying eternal death. And eternal death is this eternal separation from God, this longing for God with no hope of restoration. Paul will say, if you walk in unrepentant sin, if you don't turn from your sin, it's going to result in your eternal separation from God. And where you long for that relationship with him, you'll have no hope that it will be brought back to proper relationship. So this is the bad news of the law of sin and of death. Now, happy Easter. I hope you're wearing your Sunday's best like me. We have to start with the bad news. We gotta travel through the bad news to get to the good news, but but that's what we're gonna do now. Let's lift our eyes and see this good news of Jesus Christ. About 12 years ago for me, I first melted into the presence of Jesus with his grace. I'm enamored with him and I haven't got past it yet. So, So look back at the text with me and let's hear the good news together. Halfway through verse 54 and onward. Then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? Paul right here, the author of this text, what what he's doing in this moment is he is taunting death itself. If death is our final and our ultimate enemy, Paul is laughing in the face of death right now. He's asking death some questions. He's saying, death, where are you? I can't locate you. You're nowhere to be seen. He's saying, death, where is your victory? It seems that you're piling up the L's right now. You're not winning. Death, where is your sting? And Paul is taunting death saying, death, you have been defamed. You have been devenomized. You cannot sting the Christian anymore. He is taunting death here. How does he do that? He does that because of the glorious news of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is through the gospel that death has been swallowed up into victory. And each of our enemies, the law and sin and death, have been confronted by one angle of the work of Jesus. Each angle, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, coincides with one of our enemies. So first, let's look at how the life of Jesus defeats our law enemy. The life of Jesus defeats our enemy in the law. If our enemy is our first law, then Jesus throws a haymaker at the law. If we are totally unable to fulfill and follow the law of God, Jesus steps into the picture and for his 33 years living on earth, he perfectly and obediently follows the Father and he loves the Father and he abides in the law absolutely perfect and perfectly. And Jesus as our sovereign and sinless savior when he was living he was not only living for himself he was living for you and for i imagine again that that law or that dartboard that is the law we're called with every action with every thought with every deed to hit that bullseye every single time well jesus in his life perfectly does that. Though he was tempted and tried, he never failed, not even one time. He is perfectly spotless. But then Jesus will stand before the judge and and he will say to the judge, I didn't throw those darts, he did. I didn't throw those darts, she did. He lives not only for himself, but he lives for us. And, And he takes our failure upon himself and he gives us and credits us his righteousness and his perfection. And so when God looks at us, he doesn't see our inability to follow the law, but rather he sees the perfect righteousness of his beloved son, Jesus. And when he looks upon you, he sees you as if you have perfectly and obediently followed the law 
because the life of Jesus has been given to you. Romans 6 verse 14 will say this. For sin will have no dominion over you, no power over you, since you are not under the law, but under grace. Let that be a balm to your soul in this moment. You are no longer under the law. You cannot perfectly fulfill the law, but you are under this unmerited favor from Jesus Christ where he has given you his perfect law abiding life. It is yours by grace through faith, no work of your own. Galatians 3 will say it this way. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. How? By becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So it's not just about the life of Jesus. It's also about the death of Jesus. So let's see how the death of Jesus defeats our sin enemy. How the death of Jesus defeats our enemy in the sin. Jesus, through his death, provided way for our sins to be forgiven, our trespasses to be forgotten, everything to be paid for. So, so what does this mean? If, if, if Romans 6 says the wages of sin is death, then God exacts righteously, might I add, a payment for all of our sin. And that payment is death. And because God is holy, he requires this. And, and yet in our own sin and in our own living, we can never hope to repay this debt, this debt to God. But Jesus Christ, when he was hanged on a tree, he paid back our debt in full. Colossians 2 will say this much more clearly than I can. And you who were dead in your trespasses in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him. Here it is. Having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. How? He set it aside, nailing it to the cross. It is paid for. It is finished. Your sins are forgiven. If you are in Christ Jesus, he has taken care of your sin enemy. What does this mean for you? No more sin. It's paid for in full. No more shame. No more guilt. Romans 8.1 will say there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And let me point out to you that the text in Colossians 2 says all of your trespasses, every single one of your sins is forgiven, past, present, and future. I think so often many of us will default into this mode where we think, okay, I sinned a lot in the past and, and Christ died on the cross, so he paid for that and now I'm at neutral, but I'm gonna start racking up this debt again, so something must be done with that. That's not the gospel. Christ not only paid for it in full, but he gave you his debit card to his account of righteousness and that account will never run dry. Every one of your sins, not just in the past, but also in the present and the ones you'll commit in the future are fully, freely, forever forgiven in Christ Jesus. So rest in him. You are forgiven. You're adopted. You're cherished. You're delighted in by God. Christ died once for all. And his grace and his death are absolutely sufficient and more than enough to pay the wages of your sin. Christ's death defeats our sin enemy. But finally, what we're here to celebrate today is how the resurrection of Jesus defeats our death enemy. When Jesus was raised from the grave, he put death to death. Death is no more because Jesus is alive. Though the serpent might have bruised his heel and might have injected that uh, venomous poison into Jesus' bones and Jesus surely did die, he did not stay dead. Three days later, by the power of the Spirit, Jesus was raised to new life and though the serpent bruised his heel, Jesus crushed his head. The serpent has been defeated 
defeated and death has been defeated with him for the Christian. It is nothing but life and life forevermore. This is why Paul can taunt death in its face. And he can say, where are you, death? Where is your victory, death? Where is your sting, death? You are no more because Jesus has triumphed triumphed over you in victory through his resurrection. The bad news is that the law is coming for us and the law demands perfect obedience from us. The good news is that Jesus satisfies it in our place. The bad news is that sin wants to entangle us in this cycle of shame and guilt and more sin. The good news is that you are forgiven and freed by the Son, Jesus Christ. The bad news is that death will come knocking on your door one day. But the good news is, is that if you are in Christ Jesus, you will not die, but you will live forevermore in him. I, I've spent a lot of time in my life in Cambodia. And I remember the first funeral I saw in Cambodia. It was just a, a wild exper- experience. I was up in my hotel room, and, and I heard just kind of some wailing and ranting. And I looked out the, the window, and I saw walking down the street hundreds of people. And, and right at the center was uh, what looked like a coffin being raised up over some people. And, and everyone was really downtrodden and, and tears. And, and they, like I said, they were wailing. It was this really somber experience. And so I went to my friend who's a Khmer native and I said, why is it this way? Like, why is everyone so sad? And he kind of turned the tables on me and he said, I don't get Christian funerals. Why are Christians so happy at their funerals? Why do you guys even call them a celebration of life? And in that moment, I got to share with him the truth of the resurrection of Jesus, that that though none of us can escape this physical death, as Christians, we can absolutely celebrate that this is life, because to die is to be with Christ, and to die is gain. This is why we can celebrate through tears. This is why we can anticipate our future, even in the middle of the grief because Christ is risen. He has risen and there is an occupied throne and an empty tomb to prove it. He is absolutely risen. Which leads to my final point. What is the bridge? What connects the two? If the bad news and the good news are separated by this chasm so wide, we could never hope to cross it. And by our own effort, we never truly could cross it. How do we get there? How do we get from the bad news to the good news? Look at verse 57 with me. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is all through our Lord Jesus Christ. Just as we have to travel through a bridge to get from one side to the other, we have to travel through Christ Jesus to get from the bad news to the good news. We didn't earn it. We can't merit it. We cannot earn the love of God. We can simply receive the love that Jesus is pouring out upon us and be transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of his his beloved light. And, and, and thanks be to God that it's been done by Jesus Christ. He, he is the one who has given us this victory. Jesus, when speaking to his disciples in John chapter 11, will ask them some questions. He, here's what Jesus will say. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Here's the question. Do you believe this? Jesus says to his disciples, and he's saying to us now, whoever, whoever believes in me shall never die, but will have life. Do you believe this? And I want to key in on that word, whoever, for a second. 
You might be hearing what I'm saying today a little bit wrong. You might be hearing, okay, I know God's got this law and he wants us to obey him and he wants us to live perfectly before him. Yes, absolutely, we should desire to obey God. But what I'm not saying is go law abide and learn, earn the love of God. You cannot do that. You might be thinking, I gotta clean myself up. I gotta rid myself of some of this sin. How could God possibly love a dirty and broken person like me? How could God come after someone like me? Why would this Jesus pursue me and invite me into this life and and hear me? I said it earlier. Paul says he is the chief of sinners, but then he follows it up with this. But grace abounds. There is no sin that can outpace the abounding grace of God. There is nothing you can do to run away from Jesus far enough that he can't find you and make you his. This isn't about cleaning yourself up. This isn't about ridding yourself of something. This is about you repenting, turning from your sin, and trusting in Jesus. To believe in Jesus is to put the full weight of your trust in him. Despite the questions you might have, despite the doubts you might possess, despite whatever your background or your future looks like, to believe in Jesus is to say, I am coming after you and I am trusting that you have fulfilled the law on my behalf, that you have paid for my sins in full and that when I am in you, you have defeated death in my place and I will be resurrected and living with you forever. This is true for whoever believes in him whoever believes in Jesus. So so let me just kind of close like this. When it comes to the law, just take a breath for a second. Christian, take a breath. This isn't about white knuckling your way through this life. This is about joyfully and delighting in God and delighting in obedience to God, knowing it results in your satisfaction. And the only way you can breathe is knowing that Jesus has given you his righteousness. For the non-Christian, that can be true of you in this moment. When it comes from your, your when it comes to your sin, just rest easy for a second. You could never pay back the debt you owe, but Jesus has paid it in full and beyond. Trust in Him and rest in His finished work on the cross. When it comes to death, again, we're surrounded by it everywhere. Be liberated. Trust in Jesus. Fear no more. For the Christian, there is no death but only life, abundant life, and life forever. Do you believe this? That's the question. Join me in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that we can celebrate, that the law has been fulfilled that our sin has been paid for, that your wrath has been satisfied by Jesus on the cross, that for the Christian there is no wrath stored up for us, there's no punishment stored up for us, there's no condemnation stored up for us, that all you have for us is love and delight and joy and hope. And so God, I pray for those who have been walking with you for a long time. Would you just in this moment remind them of their salvation in Jesus Christ and cause worship to come forth. For those who are far off, God, I pray in this very moment you would draw them to yourself. You would reveal the gospel to them. You would cause the scales to be removed from their eyes and and your spirit would breathe new life into them that they would turn from their sin and trust in Jesus. God, we all have to answer this question. Do you believe this? Do we believe Jesus is the one through his life, death, and resurrection has defeated our enemies in the law, sin, and death? Do we believe this? God, I pray where we, where we don't believe, grant us the gift of belief and help us, God, with our unbelief. We love you. We thank you that we can celebrate that all of history changed on a weekend 2,000 years ago outside of Jerusalem, that everything changed. Jesus changed my life, and he's still actively in the business of changing lives around the world. So in this moment, by your Spirit's power, God, would you change lives, save souls, and draw all to yourself. We pray all of this for your glory and your majesty and your honor. In Christ's name, amen.
Now, if you're a member of Story Church, this is the time in our gathering where we give back in our tithes and our offerings, and you can see the different ways in which you can give to the church uh, now via our app or sending us a check or, or on our website. But more importantly uh, than, than how we can give today, I just want to take a second to speak to you who are not necessarily a part of the Story Church family or you haven't been. We want to invite you. Come on in. Come on in. This is a beautiful family drawn together by the grace of Jesus Christ. And, and so on our website, uh, on our online connect card, we have this little box that you can check that says, I want to be a follower of Jesus. That'll come to us and we'll reach back out to you and we would love to walk with you through what that looks like. If anything was confusing to you today, we'd love to answer any questions you might have. But at the end of the day, we want to implore you the best best decision you can make is to follow Jesus with all of your life, to put the full weight of your trust in him. And like I said earlier, since I've been following Jesus, it's, it's felt like sometimes just crawling two, two steps forward, one step back. It's not always easy, but friend, it's always worth it. And in this time where everything's been stripped from us, we're finding out that all we have is Jesus, but we're also finding out that all we need is Jesus. He's not just enough. He's more than enough. So fill out that Connect card and then make plans to join us at Starting Point next Sunday at 11 a.m. Uh, email us, visit our website, hit our events page to find out more information. Friend, I'm going to pray one more time, but just know you are absolutely loved by us and you are loved, more importantly, by God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your love, your unending, never giving up, never dying, always abounding love for us in the gospel. So I pray for those who right now are setting up all the obstacles in their mind of why they can't follow Jesus, of why they can't go to starting point, of why they can't fill out the connect card. God, would you just cause those to melt away in the glory and the majesty of Jesus Christ? I pray, God, that in this moment you would have mercy. We are all sinners in need of your mercy and grace. So would you save, we pray. In Christ's name, amen. Well, church, in Matthew 28, Jesus says to his disciples to make disciples of all nations. He sends them to the ends of the earth. And so we're going to sing a song today in both English and Spanish because the gospel is for all peoples and all nations and all tongues. Would you stand and sing with me? I cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. body bound and drenched in tears they laid him down in joseph's tomb the entrance sealed by heavy stone messiah still and all alone oh pray the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise his name forevermore. For endless days we will sing your praise. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord our God. Then on the third at break of dawn, the Son of Heaven rose again. Oh, trample death, where is your sting? The angels roar for Christ the King. Oh, praise the
in robes of white. The blazing sun shall pierce the night, and I will rise among the saints, my gaze transfixed on Jesus' face. Alabade, al Señor mi Dios, tu nombre yo proclamaré eternamente, te cantaré, Señor, Señor mi Dios, Señor, Señor mi Dios. Oh, praise the name. doxology as we do every week. So if you'd stand with me and sing the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Church, we just want to thank you for joining us this Easter. For those of you who are guests, we hope you felt welcomed, even though you're joining us digitally. We'd love to talk with you. We'd love to know how we can be praying for you. We want to hear your story. So if you have questions, we'd love for you to fill out our Connect card, fill out our prayer card, right down in the description or on our website. We'd love to reach out to you and have a conversation, get to know a little bit about your story and share more about the love and hope of Jesus with you. Well, church, I'm going to read a passage of scripture over us and then we'll be dismissed. Romans 8 says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Well, church, we love you. We hope you have a wonderful week and a happy Easter. Go in peace, church.